my name is Cindy Arnson. I'm director of the Latin American program at the Wilson Center, and I'm delighted to have as our guest uh, this afternoon, Paula Cintili, who is the CEO of PepsiCo Latin America. I'm also delighted to be um, joined by my colleague, Anya Prusa, who is the Slater Family Fellow and Senior Associate at the Wilson Center's Brazil Institute. Uh, Paula Santilli joined PepsiCo back in 2001 and rose through the ranks to become the Chief Executive Officer of, um, of PepsiCo Latin America in May of 2019, certainly breaking a glass ceiling or a glass door into uh, the CEO suite. Um, in that role, she leads uh, PepsiCo's uh, food and beverage business for Mexico, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And PepsiCo's operations in those places um, support over 70,000 direct jobs um, in our region. And we've invited Paola for this conversation because she is a pioneer um, on women's corporate leadership, but also on gener generating inclusive growth in the Americas and also contributing to the well being of the communities in which PepsiCo has operations. She is a strong champion of diversity and inclusion and is the co-author of a book that came out in 2020, uh, which I'll say in English, it's also in Spanish, but it's The Power of Empowerment, Women Building Latin America. Um, Paula is based in Mexico City. She is a native um, of Argentina, um, completed her undergraduate work at the University of Salvador in Buenos Aires, and I'm glad to uh, point out that she finished her graduate work at Miami University um, in the great state of Ohio, from which I am from. So, Paola, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, I'll ask, go right into our first question. There is a growing awareness that women's economic participation, entrepreneurship is really fundamental to global economic development. And you yourself have written and said that when women participate, everyone wins. Um, but in Latin America and the Caribbean, women, especially in the informal sector, um, and those who are in more precarious uh, household situations, including women heads of households, still face a lot of barriers. Um, the World Bank, for example, estimates that 50% of small business owners in the region are women, the highest rate of any region in the world, um, but that male entrepreneurs um, are much more likely to have access to loans and, and other financial services that are really critical to make their businesses grow. So with that background, my question to you is how do we create an environment um, that enables women's economic participation across the board in Latin America and the Caribbean? Yeah, Cindy, thank you for the question and thank you for the invitation um, to you and Anya, my, my gratitude for this space and time. Yeah, Cindy, you're right. You know, I I'm, I might be in the corporate offices very often, but my preferred state is definitely on the streets in Latin America. So because of the characteristics of our business, I'm, I love to be on farms or down the streets vis visiting little stores, etc. And that's where I have like a firsthand view of these women and the informal economy and how much help they need. No? So uh, from my point of view, from what we've learned, uh, women will thrive in Latin America. They will absolutely thrive when they have one access to finance. No, it's as old as the world can be. Women are unfortunately not treated equally. And you have to know, Cindy, the day I heard one um, agro partner of ours in Colombia explain to me that she, um, you know, she had the courage to walk into a bank and ask for a loan to buy a tractor for her community, that was a story I will never forget, no? So number one thing is, 
uh, access to finance. We do a lot of that ourselves as we service thousands and thousands of little stores. There's always a financial component of visiting the stores, offering credit, et cetera. The other thing that makes women be completely different human beings is training. How simple is that? You know, basic training, um, financial training, um, under, you know, comprehension and understanding of technology today is something that we're doing up and down the streets of, of Latin America. And that is a game changer, you know? So here we have to work all together. You no, know? we have to work all, all together in this agenda of both um, creating uh, opportunities through finance or education or both, you no? Know? And that's what we're doing, Cindy. We, you know, I could mention one example. Um, we have a program I love, which is called Women with Purpose. And we do it through a, um, an NGO called Fundes and that helps us on the ground because you, this is a contact sport, Cindy, you know? You need to follow one by one each woman and keep there uh, building her capabilities so that she feels really empowered, you know? And that's what we do, for example, with Fundes and Women with Purpose. And they help us change the life of thousands of women. We have benefited 7,000 women so far. 65% of these women tell us, hey, I started to sell more after uh, the training and the program. And I believe them, it's, it's a game-changing um, situation for, for these women on the streets. No? I would like to ask you, um, Paola, specifically about um, food and agricultural workers, uh, because we know certain sectors have greater gender inequality. Um, and the UN Food and Agricultural Organization found that female agricultural producers in Latin America earn about 24% less than men. And they're also less likely to have access to land ownership. And obviously this has implications not only for gender equality, but also for food security. And I know PepsiCo has been doing some work in this space. Um, so what exactly have you been doing to address this problem? Yeah, we, we know those facts and unfortunately we see them. As you know, PepsiCo, we, we are well known because of our brands and we have you know Gatorade and Quaker and Lay's and Cheetos, but the reality is we are an agro-industrial company, no? So I'm very proud, Anya, to say that by the end of this year, 100%, for example, of our potatoes will be under sustainable uh, farming practices. When you have sustainable farming practices, not only are we focused on water, environment, etc., but we're also focused on community and women. No, so that's a very um, important part of how we um, address the agricultural aspect of our supply chain. No, and uh, we are making sure. We have women agricultures uh, with us in our supply chain and that they have an equivalent level of training, finance, et cetera, uh, than any, any man out there. You know? The other one is food security. As you know, that as you mentioned, this is this is you know tremendously sad need today for many in Latin America. And we are partnering, for example, with the UN um, to on, on sustainable development for zero hunger. We have the most amazing programs in, in zero hunger. We develop a product that we call internally, for example, peanut. It's a combination of a product with a heavy amount of oats and peanuts. And we're feeding these to families in Guatemala, the south of Mexico, where children are showing signs of lack of nutrition. So um, eh, we're, we're here to help in this agenda. Um, what happens, Anya, is we change agricultural practices wherever we are, no? So when we arrive to an agro region, um, things change. Let me show you how, no? Before, you know, they were, 
eh, irrigating, flooding the fields. And we said, no, 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 wait a minute. That is not cool. That's not the way you're going to do that. I no, but we've always done it this way. No, 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 my friend. Let's sit down and let's really speak about how we save money. So where we have a footprint, we have a water control and a change management program uh, there that is very important. The same thing with the women agenda, you know? how to treat women on fields, what, what you know, a lot of benefits that they have to have on the fields and this equality of, of the, uh, the throughput of, of the product is very, very important. Let me um, reflect on, on what you just said in terms of the way you're dealing with the agricultural sector. Um, typically, when we think of systemic change, we think of public policy, of government public policy. Could you talk a little bit about how, as a private sector company, you are attempting to drive this structural change um, around issues of women's inclusion and and how do you interface you know with other actors that um, that are equally important yeah we it's a it's definitely a teamwork it's definitely a collaboration agenda no and as I was saying we set high standards and when you have when you set high standards for example in an agro a context, the reality is it has a wake that is enormous uh, within the entire region. So when we go to a region and say, we will buy two women and we will buy with a contract, that means that we will promise to buy 100% of your harvest by the end of the harvest moment, it'll come to us and we have assigned a pricing, no, no uh, crazy negotiations. We assign a price and we'll take 100% of your, uh, of your harvest. That is a game changer that is like wildfire, Cindy, no? Uh, because pretty soon what happens is it becomes the norm in the region. Pretty soon the local government is calling, saying, hey, what did you do, no? And how is it that you're running this program? And if PepsiCo does that, why can't another company uh, handle exactly the same fair, equitable conditions for, uh, for the, the, the population? So that we're always doing that, Cindy. We elevate the standards because we have targets that we have to achieve and we know how to do things in the right way. We have people on the ground that help us tremendously. And we also partner with, with other organizations, you know, from the International Development Bank to NGOs, et cetera, that are hugely helpful, definitely. You mentioned, Paola, this idea of elevating the standards. Obviously, PepsiCo works with thousands of women across Latin America, but you also have women within your own company, your own workforce. PepsiCo has set an internal goal of gender parity and management roles um, by 2025, which is just four years away. So how is that being implemented? And why does gender parity in management matter? Yeah, definitely. We, we like our targets, Anya, because we have a knife between our teeth and we reach our targets. In fact, my executive, co executive committee right now is 50% female, no? And we're really proud of all of them, no? A total of 43% of our entire 70,000 employees is, is female, no? So um, what, yeah, we, we still have a journey going forward. We're going to reach our targets because we uh, take them very seriously. And um, what we do is we work today in three different aspects. One is talent attraction. No? So there are many things out there. Uh, back to work, for example, is a, is a program I really like because we're attracting women that for some reason left the workforce 
and then want to come back. They're super talented, you know, and they're, they're super happy to come back to work and they're super talented and valuable for PepsiCo. Once they're inside, we have a number of development programs at different stages of the, the female gender a cohort. And, you know, my favorite one, uh, is in Speeda, for example. This in Speeda, we 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 direct to younger women in management. No, so when when a woman becomes a manager, it's a whole new territory that we make sure they feel comfortable with, etc. And other programs that are related to retention of of this valuable talent. No, so we're we'll, we're going to reach our target for sure. Um. COVID-19 has presented challenges for everybody. Um, it's been, uh, you know, devastating for the region and for especially people that work in the informal sector or who are poor already. Um, and it also has sort of increased women's burden inside the home, whether uh, certainly in Latin America and the Caribbean, perhaps a little less so in the United States, maybe in certain economic you know, strata where uh, household activities are a little more shared. But how has Pepsi um, adapted to the extra demands put on women um, around work, uh, the division between work and home responsibilities, which in many um, cases include homeschooling the children um, together with, with partners, but sometimes with the principal responsibility? Yes, Cindy, uh, most definitely COVID changed the way we thought about the world and how we lived and worked. And um, our number one um, priority when, when all this started in early March was of course the safety of our employees. No, we, we had the responsibility of continuing delivering water, Quaker, you know, snacks and other food products that we manufacture. So. Um, we are an essential uh, industry. So number one priority was keeping everybody super safe. And Cindy, you have to you know, look at the organizational health surveys that we read oftentimes. The, uh, people are super committed and super engaged and thankful because many times we were teaching about COVID a lot earlier than any government, any local organization, et cetera, no? And um, oftentimes we have found that people uh, were super safe in, in, in our, inside our company, felt safer than outside, no? Um, we, we became very creative, Cindy. We, we saw these problems that, uh, you know, long hours of work, children are out of school, et cetera. And the creativity of the teams has been amazing. So we've done things like from a mental health and mental well-being lines, phone lines, you can call and get help, you no? Know? pages and websites, et cetera, for the purpose of maintaining children uh, engage with reading, math, uh, et cetera, uh, playing if they were, if they were little. Um, uh, we had a lot of conversations on how do we manage workloads in the right timings with the right flexibility to accommodate lunch hours, is homeschooling, etc. And we learned that flexibility was the way to go, no? And that's what we are applying today in Latin America. Again, if I look, uh, Cindy, at um, our surveys, internal surveys, people are super happy to have a job, a continuation of, of training, to have the support that they have uh, from their supervisors, managers, and the general company in, in, in general. And also I'm, I'm happy with how we dealt with it. No, it was hard, but it was, it was successful. I think one of the, the challenges that women also face is, is right juggling all of this um, and trying to take control over the trajectory of their careers. And you co-authored a book last year called um, El Poder de Poder, 
excuse my Spanish, uh, normally speak in Portuguese. Um, but it, it's the power of empowerment, right? Women building Latin America. And in it, you're offering women advice on how to take control of their careers. I'm curious to know what prompted you to write that book? Yeah, I had never written a book, Anya, and this was a huge uh, learning experience for me. Um, listen, this is the story about the book. I um, One day I went to a, a, an executive coach, Marty Selman. He's very well known in the United States. And then a colleague of mine, Monica Bauer, she's the SVP of, con of Corporate Affairs, also went to visit the same a coach. And we began a triangle of conversation. No? So the two of us women from Latin America sort of corrected Marty and say, no, no Marty, this is, you know, this is different in Latin America. This is how we see things. And eventually, one, we learned a lot in the conversation with the three of us, in, in the coaching we got from Marty, we learned a lot. And one day, it just came up. We said, you know, we should write this down in a book. It's not a secret. We have to share these learnings with as many women as possible. And it's sad because there isn't that much written on this subject in Spanish, no? So there's tons of um, books written in English, but in Spanish for the Latin American women, not that much, no? So um, we, we are happy to have kind of filled in that void. And it's a very simple book. It carries 12 um, rules, we call them 12 tips, suggestions. No, you might use one or two or three. And, um, and they're exemplified with, with real women that we know from our work in the supply chain and in frontline and sales and operations. And you know, these women bring to life the rules. And the rules are all about power, no? It's, um, um, and I really like this uh, empower her thing that we have for Women's International Day this, this time. It's about showing women that they do have the power to change their context, no matter their situation, no? And um, that's what the book is about, Anya. I hope one day you can read it. I'll send you one. Carla Santilli, CEO of PepsiCo Latin America. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you for the leadership that you've shown within your own company, but also the way your company is modeling a form of uh, women's inclusion and empowerment um, in the countries that you are operating in. Thank you again. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Anya.